title of the sermon this evening is Divide and Conquer. Divide and Conquer. I want you to look with me here at Acts chapter number 23, verse number 1. I want to look at an example of where we can see this strategy being played out. And funny enough, it's actually the Apostle Paul using the strategy of divide and conquer. It tells you here in chapter number 23, verse number 1, And Paul earnestly, beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. For sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? And they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? Then said Paul, verse 5, I wist not, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. Now I want you to look here in verse number 6, what it says. And watch very closely. It says, But when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren... I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. Verse 7, And when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, funny enough, as I said, we find the perfect example. I believe, and I'm going to give you another example here in just a moment. We find the perfect example of this strategy being played out at the hands of the Apostle Paul. Now, what's going on, of course, Paul had been taken. He has been, you know, uh, 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 you know, taken to prison is what ultimately is going on here. He's put into bonds. He's carried away. There was an argument and a fight that was going on. He's being questioned. And the high priests, of course, are persecuting him for being a Christian ultimately. And he's being taken in, and they're trying to silence the Christians is what's going on. They want to shut the Christians up. And right now, Paul realizes that he's in trouble. Paul realizes that he is in danger. And the high priest is sitting here, and he's basically interrogating Paul. And what do you think Paul wants? When you're in bonds, what's the number one thing that's going to be in your mind? What do you want? You want to get out. You want to get free, right? I mean, if you're in bonds, what are you going to be wanting? You're going to be desiring to get the bonds off. You're going to be desiring to get free. So what is Paul's motive? What is his agenda right now? It's to be set free. So what his desire is, is to be set free. Who is his enemies? Who would be his enemies in this case? It tells you, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Well, we see him being interrogated, and then, and then there in verse number 5, you know, he responds, he says, Then said Paul, I wist not, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. Then it says this, But, it's almost like Paul then, while, maybe while he's speaking, while he's looking around, he notices something. Something occurs to him and it says, But when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council. Now we're told something about the Sadducees by the mouth of Jesus in the Gospels. What's something very specific about the Sadducees? They reject the resurrection. Now the Pharisees, they believe in the resurrection, it tells you. But the Sadducees, they reject the resurrection. And you know, he looks around and he notices, he's like, oh, these are all Jews that are standing before me. But I notice that they're a little bit different. They're of a different denomination, right? You know, you, you, it's basically like you have the Baptists, right? Baptists wouldn't be Pharisees at all, but you have the people who are accused of that. You have the Baptists and you have the Jehovah's Witnesses, right? And you notice like, hey, what's a big difference between these two people? So he looks over the Pharisees and, and the Sadducees. And he realizes there's these two sects here and he knows a big difference between them. So he does this. Look at what it says. And when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council. So then he says something. He cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Now, is that true? It's not technically true presently, to be honest. But he was born a Pharisee and was raised a Pharisee in that sense. He says, I am a Pharisee and the son of a Pharisee. And then he says, Of the hope, of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. So he just, 
he just, you know, spits out while he's right there in the middle of these two people, knowing that one of the major doctrinal differences that the Pharisees and the Sadducees have is one believes in the resurrection and the other does not. He makes sure to make a note of, a, a note of that while he's sitting there and while he's being interrogated. He, he blurts this out and says, hey, do you know the reason why I'm here? Men and brethren, it probably seemed kind of awkward the way in which he brought this up. Men and brethren, you know, I'm a Pharisee. And he says, and for the hope of the resurrection, I am called into question. Now look at what it says next. Verse 7. And when he had so said, look at this, there arose a dissension. Now what does that mean? A divide. An argument, right? They're, they're arguing and they're debating with one another. Between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And then it even says this. And the multitude was divided. Paul had a goal with that. Paul had a goal with why, why, the whole purpose why he brought that up. It says that he perceived that one was a Pharisee and one was a Sadducee. And he had a goal and he had an agenda to try to do what? To try to divide. Now he had something that he wanted to get done ultimately. What was his ultimate goal? He wanted to be set free. Keep reading. Verse 8. For the Sadducees say, there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the, the Pharisees, I'm sorry, confess both. And there arose a great cry. And there's this, this massive argument, almost like an uproar, where people are fighting amongst one another about this just because Paul said, hey, can you imagine like hundreds of people sitting here? He's being interrogated over in a corner. They're smacking him around and stuff. And then he sees while they're talking to one another, like one group's a Pharisee, one group's a Sadducee. And then he just, he just yells out, hey, you know, I'm a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, and for the hope of the resurrection is the whole reason why I'm called into question. And then all of a sudden, the, the Sadducees are like, hey, we don't believe in the resurrection. Is that why this guy's brought in? He's like, and then the Pharisees are like, what do you mean you don't believe in the resurrection? What are you talking about? You don't know what the scriptures say? And then they just get back and forth and they start arguing. What do you think Paul's doing? He's sitting over here like, yeah, this is perfect. This is exactly what I want. What is his desire? He wants to be set free. He wants to be set free. Do you know what he's employing right now? He's employing the strategy of divide and conquer. That's exactly what's going on. And what took place says, and the multitude was divided. It says, the multitude was divided. Divided. Look at verse 8. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man. So saying, now they're basically saying, oh, we just, we're on his side. We'll find any evil in this man. And they say, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. It shows what hypocrites they are too, by the way. It's like, oh, maybe an angel talked to him. Why? Because now they have a bigger enemy that they're fighting against. They've totally forgotten about their argument and their problem with Paul. Now who's their B for their issue with? Now it's with the Sadducees. They're like, maybe a spirit, you know, spoke to him or an angel. I'm not going to fight with him. Why? Because I'm going to fight with you. This is, this, what you see right here is a, a perfect, a playbook example of divide and conquer. It says in verse 10 again, and when there arose a great dissension. That's an argument, a fight, contention. The chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. To define, I'm going to define for you divide and conquer. If you just type it up in, on Google, this is exactly what you'll get. The policy of maintaining control over one's subordinates or su subjects by encouraging dissent between them. I want you to turn to 2 Samuel chapter number 2. Divide and conquer, it plays out in a few different uh, settings. Uh, divide and conquer is used sometimes in just personal examples. Sometimes it's used, you know, like we saw right there, you know, that, that would be an example within, within uh, different social classes. Obviously, you have leaders there that have taken a man that is subject unto them, and then he kind of reverses the roles on them. And, uh, but as I said, the definition, you know, it, it, you, uh, the, the typical definition is where people that already have control, they will, they will, use, uh, uh, they will employ this particular strategy in order to keep people in subjection unto them. And the point is to encourage dissent. Now, uh, divide and conquer in one sense, you've probably seen this play out in your own household multiple times. And uh, the most common example is with a child. 
and where a child will try to divide and conquer with his parents. Now, it, you know, there are certain elements of it that are missing in certain cases because it's not exactly the same all the time. But what will a child do if they want something? You know what they'll do is they'll go to one parent and they'll ask the one parent, hey, you know, can I have some ice cream? And, you know, mom says, no, you can't have any ice cream. So you know what they do is, mom and dad are right there, or maybe mom's not with dad right now, and maybe dad walks in the room. Are they going to try to ask dad right now at this point? No. It's not, it's not the exact same example, but this is still a, 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 uh, a template of, of divide and conquer. You know what they would do is they'd wait for dad to walk away. What do they want? They want that division, that space in between the two. They want them to not be together. I'm going to show you how these are the two, both of these are, they qualify as examples of dividing and conquering. They don't want them to be together. Maybe dad walks in the room right after that and they're like, man, I need to ask dad. They wait for dad to leave though. Maybe dad goes out in the garage and they're like, dad, can I get some ice cream? And he's like, sure, son, go ahead. Go get some ice cream. And then the child goes inside and gets ice cream. Now, divide and conquer is also used in warfare. This is a very common strategy when it comes to warfare. I want you to look with me at 2 Samuel. I'll need to get there myself. 2 Samuel chapter number 10. 2 Samuel chapter number 10. We can see one example of this. And there's actually a few examples, but I believe that this is one of the best examples. 2 Samuel chapter number 10. Uh, look at verse number 6. It says, When the children of Ammon saw that they stank, let's talk about their reputation, before David, the children of Ammon sent and hired the Syrians of Beth Rehob and the Syrians of Zobah, 20,000 footmen, and of King Maacah, 1,000 men, and of Ishtab, 12,000 men. And when David heard of it, he sent Joab and all the host of the mighty men. And the children of Ammon came out and put the battle in array at the entering in of the gate. And the Syrians of Zobah and of Rehob and Ishtab and Maacah were by themselves in the field. When Joab saw that the front of the battle was against him, before, and then it says, and behind, he chose of all the choice men of Israel and put them in array against the Syrians. He says, and the rest of the people he delivered into the hand of Abishai, his brother, that he might put them in array against the children of Ammon. And he said, if the Syrians be too strong for thee, I'm sorry, for me, then thou shalt help me. But if the children of Ammon be too strong for thee, then I will come and help thee. And it says, be of good courage and let us play the men for our people and for the cities of our God. And the Lord do that which seemeth thee, I'm sorry, the Lord do, do that which seemeth him good. Now if you look up divide and conquer, there are, like I said, there are a few different types of situations where this will play out in. If you look up divide and conquer when it comes to warfare, it's, it's a little bit different than that very first example. And what it is is where you try to segment or you try to compartmentalize groups that you are fighting against. What you do, want to do is you want to partition them. You want to divide them up and you want to handle one at a time. Now dividing and conquer can, like we saw there, uh, uh, carry the element of when the division occurs, fighting occurs, right? Between those two segments. But not always. You know, sometimes, like I said, within the example of warfare, if you look that up in military strategies and read about that, it's basically just where they'll just come in and they'll just split into two groups. And they'll say, hey, you attack that side. Don't let them go together. Why? Because they're stronger together. It's the same concept between the two points. Now, why did Paul want to separate the Pharisees and the Sadducees? What was the reason? Because if they were unified coming at him, they were strong. But if they were broken apart, and in this case, arguing with one another, that's how he brought this division was by, to cause them to argue with one another, then they were much weaker. Well, right here, the same thing is going on with the Syrians and with Ammon. See, in this situation, Joab did not want them to all just kind of gang up on him all at the same time. So he said, hey, you know, Joab said in verse number, where are we at? With Abishai. Verse number 10 is where he, it, with, it tells you about what he did. It says, and the rest of the people he delivered into the hand of Abishai, his brother, that he might put them in array against the children of Ammon. So he's got the Syrians and, a and uh, the, the, the children of Ammon fighting against him. He does not want them unified. He doesn't want them coming together. 
So what he does is he separates his two groups. This is a perfect example of divide and conquer. He separates his group, his one group if you will, his one army, unified army, into two groups. And he says, hey, you go that way and I'll go this way. What's the purpose and what's the reason? Divide and conquer. Keep them apart from one another. We don't want these two armies enclosing on us because if they're both fighting against us together at the same time while we're, you know, obviously center right in the middle of them, that's even, you know, worse too at that point. And from before and from behind, we're going to be destroyed. So you say, you know what we need to do? We need to divide them up. So in order to do that, they had to divide up. We're going to have to go get them on this side, and then, you know, you go get them, the Syrians, on the other side. So this is something that people will employ in warfare. It's something people use on just virtually every social structure, social ranking. You know, you see this in the household, like I said, in the example of where they try to just keep, you know, the parents separate. They'll divide and conquer. They have an agenda, and they can't have them together because they were both standing there when you said, hey... You know, Mom, can I have ice cream? And Dad heard. What, what are they going to say? The dad's going to be like, no. If they were both together, what would they do? They would have unity, wouldn't they? They would be on the same page. If Dad heard Mom say, hey, you can't have ice cream, what would Dad say? He would say no. But notice they've got to make sure Dad's in the other room. They're divided from one another. They're not together. There's not unity there, right? So what's the purpose of the division? The purpose, obviously, is to... Break the strength that comes with unity. When you are united and when people are brought together, there is a strength that is brought about through that. I want you to turn in your Bibles. I want you to go ahead and turn to Exodus chapter number 18, verse number 21. Exodus chapter number 18, verse number 21. I'm going to give you a couple of points about where this originated, where this came from in the first place. Now, the, the phrase that we use today, divide and conquer, divide and conquer is actually a Latin phrase. And the Latin phrase is, it's divide, I guess it would be divide et impera, I guess is how you would pronounce it with the Latin uh, uh, pronunciation. But really what it means, literally, is it means divide and rule. It's the same concept. Divide and conquer. And actually where this phrase was found was Julius Caesar is where the phrase is derived from. It's a quote taken from Julius Caesar. And it's speaking about how the Romans would politically control... Uh, you know, all of their citizens. So this is most commonly known of something that is used in sociology, where within a society, those that will rule over, you know, the underclass, whoever it may be, the elites will rule over their society, they'll rule over their citizens, and they will make sure that they cause division in certain circumstances. Why? They don't want there to be too much unity. They don't want within a society for people to have too much unity. And what's the reason? Because people are stronger that way. And this was something that was employed, in, as I said, in the Roman Empire. It was a very famous tactic. It's actually, if you look it up, it's found in a few different writings and mentioned a few different ways that they would practice dividing and conquering. This is a real thing that takes place. And number one, the number one reason why it's dangerous for those that are, you know, let's say, within the society, that aren't uh, employing the strategy of dividing and conquering, if you are a victim of it, number one, it's because it ends up consuming all of your time. It ends up consuming all of your time. What do I mean by that? The division always brings about fighting when it's in a, within a society. The division, whatever dis division that it is, they always bring, a, bring this division about through some sort of fighting, through some, some sort of quarrel within society, some sort of you know, argument, whatever it may be. And it causes people to become obsessed with this issue. Because you know what they need is, just like with the Pharisees and just like with the Sadducees, they need, they need to find something, and these a lot of times it can be artificial differences, but they need to find something that you can become obsessed with that you will be loyal to aside. They need to find in some way that a, a, a difference between the groups of people that are within their society that they know that you would become loyal to. And once they do that, then all of a sudden you become consumed with this, whatever this you know, difference is, whether it be artificial or not. The manipulative you know, tactics of that don't really matter, but 
they, they cause you, number one, to become consumed with it. Number two, obviously, it causes people to fight amongst each other. It causes people to fight amongst each other. Now, in recent U.S. politics, this has taken place. And tonight, obviously, I'm not preaching on end times Bible prophecy, but I felt it necessary to bring this up just because it's just one thing after the next that's been taking place. And I've been noticing, you know, just uh, in, you know, I would say particularly in social media, just how even Christian brothers and sisters are just becoming obsessed with this issue. They're becoming consumed with this issue of just, all of these different, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, fights or quarrels that are going on. These different, you know, uh, the coronavirus, the racial baiting that's been going on. And when you look at, when you take a step back and you look at the events that have taken place in the United States of America, one after the next, it becomes very obvious that this, these were, they were at the very least exploited for social engineering purposes to bring about the fulfillment or accomplishment of certain agendas. Number one, if we look at the coronavirus, if we look at what took place with the coronavirus, we look at the difference in how our country is after the coronavirus popped its ugly head up into our society, what would you say the major difference is within people? I would say the major difference is that their people are a lot more divided. Because one of the main things that they brought about with this is they brought about fear. They cause everyone to be very, very afraid. And when people are walking around afraid, it's just like the, the stereotypical person that is afraid is just constantly just like, they, they view everything as a threat. Everything around them, they're constantly looking at it and they think that it's some sort of threat. Something that's going to hurt them. And what people were doing is, if you're not, you know, and, and, and there's so many issues that are tied into it. It, it turned pro -vac, the pro-vaccine, anti-vaccine argument arose again, didn't it? Had people debating and arguing about that. It brings up the argument of whether or not you trust your government. So everybody who's pro-establishment versus those that are anti-establishment, that argument came up again. Everybody's arguing and fighting about, uh, you know, whether you are pro-modern medicine, modern, you know, medical community, or whether you're kind of against that and you have, you know, alternative methods when it comes to, you know, uh, uh, how you view medicine and things along those lines. You know, and then just in general, those that are especially, a big divide is mask or no mask. I mean, how big of an argument has that brought on? What is the purpose? What is the goal? What do you see as the result of when this coronavirus arose in the United States of America? It's one of the, I would say this, that at the end of both of these events, that the country, and I would say that everyone in here would agree with me, that the country, the United States of America, I've lived here my entire life. And I would say, you know, categorically, that the country is more divided today than it has ever been in my lifetime. Would everyone agree with that? Would you say that the country is more divided today? That there's more fighting? That there's more arguing? That people seem more, you know, uh, just suspicious of one another? People are quicker to bite each other's heads off? People are quicker to fight and argue and bicker about things than they were before? So who wins, ultimately? And you type of see this. Exactly. The politicians. Those that are in power. Who wins in this type of situation? Then you see the coronavirus die down. And almost immediately, immediately, a national crisis arose once again with what? Racial baiting. Now, if you, if you look at everything that took place with just the George Floyd situation, everything that happened with George Floyd... If you look at that situation, it is literally, it is like the, uh, you know, it's so much of this is. It is literally like the perfect, the perfect scenario that you would expect a politician to try to employ or use in order to divide and conquer. If you look at the United States of America, what, what history does the United States of America have? Obviously we have racial tension issue with slavery being there and other countries jumping on the bandwagon to attack America and things. There's racial, there's racial tension in the past in the fight for, for rights and things like that when it comes to race, isn't there? 
That's a fact in the United States of America. Now, I don't, I don't believe that there is systemic racism today or anything like that. But as far as the history of the United States of America, that's still there. We're taught this in school. You're, 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 you're fed this stuff about all the racial fights and things like that and racial you know, uh, 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 wars and, and all of this type of stuff. Why w Wouldn't it make perfect sense that if the politicians, the people that are in power, if they wanted to divide America... What angle would they go at? What part of the United States of America would they attack? Race. When you look at what took place with, with the racial wars and all of the racial fightings and all of that stuff, what do you think the outcome of that was? And I want you to look at things that came from the news media. I want you to look at things that came from the media outlets. I want you to look at, how, do you th what do you think that their job would be just as U.S. citizens? Don't you think that they would care about unifying the country? Wouldn't you think that ultimately? That they would desire? I mean, doesn't everybody in here want us and the United States of America ultimately just to get along? Like, hey, you believe differently, whatever about this subject, that subject. But hey, do you think there needs to be fighting in the United States of America? Of course not. People need to be destroying things and hating one another. Of course not. Does it seem like the media has that type of attitude? Of course, they do not have that type of attitude. Not even close. It's very, very obvious that everything that's coming out of the news and everything that's coming out of the media is meant, is meant to, to you know, foment racial tension and racial fighting and division with one another. For what reason? What's the purpose? Why do you want people to be divided? Why would they, think about that. Why would they constantly be putting out all of these different articles, all of these different stories, just to cause people just to fight in, 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 you know, on Facebook threads, to fight in comments, just to become more angry and more divided? Where would that be coming from? It would be coming from those that have certain agendas that they want to get fulfilled. It would be coming from those that are ten intentionally trying to divide people in order to conquer them in some area. That they have an agenda or something that they want to accomplish. Now, as Christians, one thing that I have noticed even more so, and I almost even fell into this at one point, and I know we've discussed this just amongst us personally a few times, as Christians... You know, one thing that we need to make sure that we do is we keep our, our, our you know, mind on spiritual things and on spiritual wars and on the Bible. And hey, there are dark forces and they can be involved and they're often involved in high places. But I've noticed more so than ever that Christians have been being pulled into these political arguments, these racial arguments, these, you know... Uh, uh, you know, left, right debates that have been going on. And even those that I would say that would be a part of like the truth movement, when it comes to these issues, I've noticed that even those people have been kind of drug into one of the two positions. Of this, you know, uh, uh, this, you know, false dichotomy of right versus left that we have in the United States of America. And that's exactly what they want to do. What they want to do is they want to bring about this specific fight, this specific divide where they force you to either fall into their mold of slot one or slot two. And many people that are aware of this false dichotomy, you know, when it comes to politics and that how they're both actually the same. I've seen so many people basically kind of backpedal into that position where they're supporting. You know, my job is not to get you to not be a Republican. That's not what I'm saying right now at all. And I'll get to why it's important here in just a minute. But I've seen people backpedal into this position where they're almost, you know, just supporting the Republican platform. And I'll talk to you why that's dangerous in just a minute. Where they're just, they're, they're all on board with every type of conservatism and, and Republicans and neo-Republicans and all of that. People that are, were aware to the lies, people that were aware that the politics is all just a game and it's not real and that they're playing you and even you know and, and a lot of these people have just jumped on what's considered the Trump train and things like that and people that went to this church have done that 
And this, you know, what is the purpose of it and when did it come about? I want you to think about that. Because you say, oh, it's not that different. People are being manipulated. And it's changing people's lives in multiple different ways. What's the purpose of coronavirus? And then right after that, race wars. And I want you to look at how the, that brings about this fight. It's, you're either pro-police or you're Black Lives Matter. And they're like, pick one. You have to fall into one of these categories. You're either far-right Republican or whatever, you know, you know re just Republican, or you're Democrat. You know, and you say, why does it matter? What's the difference? You know, what's the difference between the two? And people that are not aware of all of these differences, people that are not aware of, you know, what's really going on behind the scenes and what the people really actually believe, you know, like Donald Trump, for example, he's been someone that, even to me, he almost kind of deceived me because he speaks the right, he speaks the right way. Now, what, what, are, poli what are politicians known for? Politicians are known for talking the talk, but not walking the walk. And I would say that Donald Trump is the perfect, he's the best example of that in a very long time. Even people that are a part of the truth movement, and we're aware to all of these lies and stuff that are going on in the government, all the wicked things that are going on in the government, many of those people have even jumped on the Trump train. Many of those people have even jumped behind Donald Trump and supported this guy. Why should we not be supporting someone like Donald Trump or allowing that to, to categorize us? And this is why it's dangerous because many people today, they're even more so, they're Republican before they're Christian. And they allow, their, they allow their Republican views to decide their Christianity, oftentimes. Donald Trump his entire life voted pro-abortion. His whole entire life. His whole life Donald Trump was what, voted for abortion. Even post-birth abortion he voted for. And then the guy supposedly has a change of heart right when he runs on the Republican platform. And now he's pro-life. But I don't know if you're aware of this, and I actually have the stats that I printed off right here, that Donald Trump, since, Planned Parent, since Donald Trump has been in office, he has supported Planned Parenthood by $23 million more than any president prior to him. 23. We're talking about abortion right now. $23 million more than, in, than it was Barack Obama was who had supported Planned Parenthood prior. Donald Trump, when he ran for president, there's multiple pictures of this guy holding up the rainbow flag that says, even this is just openly LGBTQ for Trump is what it says. He said multiple times, I've done more for, you know, the LGBT community than any other, you know, person that's been prior to me, any, any president that's ever ran before me. And even if you just want to look at basic freedoms, the outside of necessarily things that are, should be you know, the main important issues to us in Christianity, I mean, look at things like the red flag law that he passed. You think that's in support of freedoms and protecting your right to protect yourself? Not even close. Are you kidding me? What a joke. And I've seen so many Christians that, you know... Have, have been opposed to and preaching against. And, and hey, you say, oh, I don't think you should mix politics with this type of stuff. Jesus did. John the Baptist did. John the Baptist was beheaded for preaching against the politicians of his day and their evil and their wickedness. So I don't think that these things should be mixed. No, the, this is why it matters because the politicians of the day of where you live, they have a big influence on you to the point where they can, they can persuade your beliefs, they can persuade your, the way you live, they can cause you to completely change how you are. They can take a Christian who's fundamental, who's serving God and turn him into a liberal and not even know it and still think that he's a conservative, calling himself a conservative. I want you to look at Exodus chapter number 18. People, Christians oftentimes, that's what I'm talking about, Christians oftentimes will, you know, they'll often say, hey, well, well when I'm voting for, and you point out these things about like Donald Trump or whoever it is, and you, and you point out all this evil stuff that they'll do, and they'll say one thing and do something else, they'll oftentimes say, hey, well, I'm not voting for a spiritual leader or a pastor, I'm voting for a president. Well, the Bible gives you qualifications for what a, a, an actual leader of a nation should do or what a judge should be. Look at Exodus chapter number 18, verse number 21. 
Exodus chapter number 18, verse number 21, it says this. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men. And then it says this. Such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. According to the Bible, when someone's going to be set into a position of rulership, of leadership, this would be the qualifications of those people. This is, this is what would make a good leader. Obviously, you need to be a just man. It says you need to fear God. And notice something that's very, very important. It says you need to hate covetousness. Now, you think Donald Trump is a man that, that hates covetousness? I'd say he's as far from that as could possibly be. He is the, one of the most covetous people probably. I mean, rich people are covetous. And you look at how proud the guy is. And, you know, those two things normally go hand in hand with one another. You know, and this, this just jumping back into, you know, just, just being consumed with politics. That's what it does. You know what it often does? It takes people out of church. It gets people's minds out of the Bible. It gets people's minds on, you know, the things of this world. I want you to turn to Colossians chapter number 3 and I want to end there. So this, this evening's sermon is very different style than usual. It's just something that's been on my mind, something that I've noticed and has been bothering me. And I think it's very important that we, you know, bring attention to this in our own Christian lives. Satan obviously is behind the conquering and the dividing. And you know what he, he ultimately wants to do is he wants to, he wants to pit people against one another. He wants to, you know, have people, you know, you know, you know uh, uh, just fighting with one another. You know what he wants to do is he likes to split churches. He likes to cause people to fight. He likes to cause people to be against one another. And right now I've noticed that there's been a major change in so many different people that we all know. So many different people, not just a few, but so many different people where they've taken their minds, they've taken, you know, where their heart was in the first place off of the things of God, off of heaven, off of, you know, the word of God. And they've put it on modern day politics. They've put it on modern day events. I'm not saying there's not a time and place to talk about these things. I talk about them and I'm interested in them to a degree. But that's not where my heart is. That's not where I'm going to spend my time. This world will be gone one day. This world will be burned up one day and all that will be left is the things that are eternal. And that's all that's going to matter at that point. You're not going to be worried about, you know, who was president in this year or that year or whatever. Look at Colossians chapter number 3, verse number 2. I want to end with this. Look, we'll read verse 1 first. If ye then be risen with Christ... Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Now why? For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. We as Christians, we need to set our affections on things above. We need to stay, make sure that we are spiritually minded. We need, we need to make sure that we're not becoming obsessed with all of these different issues. And this divide and conquer, I've noticed that when this took place, that when all this division took place, a lot of different people just fell into one of those two slots. They just fell, they just went after, like we were saying the other day, one of those two wings. They just picked one of those. They fell to the closest slot that they felt like they fit into. That's what they did. You know, the police issue, they'll try, they're trying, they try to bring a divide with that. You gotta pick a side. It's Republican, Democrat. You gotta pick a side. And you think, oh, these are pol political issues. Ultimately, at the core of them, they're moral issues. When you really look deep down, there's moral issues that are involved in there. And we need, to, we need to use the Bible as our standard. And we need, to, we need to have an authority. And this Republican, Democrat, this political divide, whatever it is. Whatever it is. You know, even if you say, hey, I'm a libertarian constitutionalist. I don't agree with everything libertarians believe. I don't agree with every single thing a constitutionalist believes. 
I'm still going to disagree with them on certain things. Because that party, or whatever it may be, or that person, whoever it may be, that I support, is not my authority. The Bible is my authority. That's the point that I want to get across to you. The Bible should be your authority. This should be your judge of what right and wrong is and what you should believe. You have to have an authority. If you don't, you're going to be tossed to and fro. Keep yourself spiritually minded. Keep your nose in this book. Keep your mind on things that are above as opposed to those, the, the things that are on the earth. Now, I realize this is a very different style sermon. But I'm sure that everyone understands why this particular sermon would have been preached. After just looking around over the past month and seeing all the different changes in so many different people. So make sure that, you know, that what your life is being consumed with and the things that you are doing are things that are spiritual and things that are eternal. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that we have an authority that we can hang our hat on and, and uh, not be uh, uh, confused and just sifting through you know, uh, all the garbage just to you know, lean upon our own understanding and, and uh, be so confused. Dear Lord, we love you so much. We thank you for everything that you've done for us. We ask you to bless us, bless our church. And uh, we, we uh, ask you to bless all the prayer requests, dear Lord, that have been brought forward. And uh, just be with us and bless the church this evening. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.